Hi everyone, this is Samira from Mantech Errors. Welcome to another episode of the Patient from Hell podcast. Over the last many episodes, you've probably heard a number of stories and caregivers and ex experts who come to our episode. Today, I have a really special guest. Her name is Gayatri. She is a mother of a child who went through cancer. So today we'll get to hear her story. And then more importantly, she's also a cancer researcher. So you'll get to hear that too. So with that, Gayatri, welcome to our podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Gayatri, so tell us a little bit about how it is you came to where you are in life. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I guess my passion for biology and biochemistry started with my mother, who's a pediatrician in India, and uh, she... In her 40s, she did her a PhD in medical genetics. So um, I was fascinated with her books and I used to read. And um, that sort of drove me into the research line. I wanted to also do a PhD like her. Um, so I did my PhD in biochemistry and I came over to Stanford uh, for a postdoctoral fellowship. And this was in the radiology department. And uh, uh, it was in a program called the Molecular Imaging Program. And uh, my reasons actually for joining the postdoctoral fellowship was uh, they were exploring ways to study RNA. And my PhD had been in RNA biology. And so that's why I joined it. But it was really interesting because um, that program, the focus really was um, developing ways to look at diseases in, um, in animals and, you know, using animals to sort of mimic human diseases, uh, but developing ways to look at those diseases without hurting the animals. So they called it non-invasive imaging. So, um, and that was my first exposure really to, so we used to establish uh, cancer models in these mice and study ways to image cancer. And that was my sort of introduction to cancer research. Um, and yeah, that's how I started my journey on uh, cancer research. And, um, and then I spent over 12 years at Stanford and, uh, um, and the program was very translational. So they, their goal was, um, things that they developed, they wanted to take it all the way to patients. Um, so that was a lot of why um, I was really interested in the program because there was that focus on patient and patient care. Yeah. That's amazing. And so um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's sort of like a little bit of my um, uh, background. Uh, and and then now actually I've um, um, graduated from academia, so to speak, and I've joined a, a biotech company. And it and um, uh, what I'm doing here is also really interesting. Here, what we're exploring is in vitro diagnostics, which is also something that's really important for cancer research, and that's um, a big part of why I joined this company. So tell us a little bit more about your imaging work as a researcher in cancer. So our audience, Gayatri, is across the world, and we have a range of people listening in. So we have everyone yeah. from caregivers and patients and survivors, and then all the way to researchers and academic people. So for academic people, yeah. molecular diagnostics, you have your <laughs> diagnostics, you have your chemistry background. For all the, all the people who are patients like myself and survivors, why why is imaging important what were you trying to show from your research and then what were you trying to sort of achieve what was that end goal you were trying to achieve yeah so um uh, after my postdoc i joined this uh incredible professor at stanford uh and he um his passion was really early detection of cancer and um, 
imaging uh, is important because, um, so first of all, uh, radiology and imaging, that's how they know how, uh, where the patient's cancer is, right? So um, any patient that's going through cancer or has is suspected of having um, a, a cancer, uh, first of all, they go through either an MRI um, or they go through a CT scan uh, or uh, x-rays uh, for, for lung cancer, for example. Um, and then um, another um, uh, imaging modality that's uh, sort of not that well known, but is really important for cancer is called PET uh, or positron emission tomography. Um, and um, PET is uh, where they inject like a radio labeled agent. Um, and it's actually a radio labeled glucose molecule. And it turns out that cancer cells have this um, avidity for glucose. So they eat up glucose. And the reason is really cancer cells are just growing. They're continuing to grow and proliferate and divide. So they need energy. And so they consume a lot of glucose. And so that's why they take up this um, um, tracer. We call it a tracer. So glucose tracer, radio labeled glucose. And so then they put these patients through our scanner, a PET scanner, and uh, the areas where the glucose has been taken up just lights up. And, uh, and it turns out that it's an exquisitely sensitive uh, modality or uh, imaging technique because it's able to pinpoint, you know, really small masses of cells um, in uh, all over your body. So that's the power, right? It, it's, it, it tells you where all the cancer has in a, in a, spread in a patient. So um, our lab was focused on um, all of these uh, techniques and um, how can we improve on them. The problem with these techniques is that they're great. They pick up uh, cancer, but invariably it's at a stage when it's already spread, when it's a large lump. And um, our professor, um, he was... Uh, convinced that, you know, we needed to develop ways where we catch the cancer before uh, it, it's, it's become this huge mass because before it has spread. So um, that was sort of the focus of the lab, early detection and, uh, um, and how can we achieve it for cancer. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm really glad you went into kind of the mechanism of how that scans work. From a patient lens, the only reason I know that is because um, one of my mentors actually told me how it worked when I was getting diagnosed, and I had no idea. So, but but having yeah. that, when I got that injection for the <laughs> radio radioactive material, it is a surreal feeling. So it it's kind of this like coldness that spreads through yeah. my arm because they injected in my sort of left arm, and it's just kind of uh -huh. you can feel it spread in your body, it is it is unlike any of the other imaging modalities that I, I was at least exposed to. And it, I thought it was it was in my yeah. And then in talking to other uh, patients who've gone through yeah. it, it is this like shared uh, sensation. Yeah. And it happens across cancers, right? Because pets are used oh, across two types and yeah. it's not just breast cancer. So it's yeah. one of the few imaging modalities that um, regardless of kind of what kind of cancer you've had, you you likely have gotten a PET scan, and it is just it's um, it's very interesting to hear the sort of scientific side and then the patient experience side kind of together. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's right. Because I I mean yeah no, and I never knew that patients experience that. So that's uh, something that I will keep in mind <laughs> as I continue. Um, yeah. No, because that's, uh, that's something our mentor also always emphasized that you've got to think of the patient that's actually going to receive all this invention um, and, you know, the output of your research. Always keep the patient in mind. I'm super glad. That is, that is uh, quite literally the goal of our podcast. <laughs> um, yeah. So 
Yeah. Tell us more, guys. So you're at Stanford. You're doing all this early detection work. And then you're at this lab with this yeah. amazing professor. Tell us a little bit more about what happens in life. Yeah. So, you know, this is a, it's an interesting, um, yeah, uh, it was a really interesting life experience, so to speak. So, you know, I was going along really happy in this lab with the professor and, you know, well-funded lab with tons of money and everyone passionate and eager to work. And um, uh, a couple of things happened, um, uh, you know, professionally, the lab was doing well. My professor had just become the head of the department and then sort of tragedy struck in my professor's life, a personal life. So uh, in his own family, his son was diagnosed with uh, actually a brain tumor. And um, I still remember vividly, and I, you know, I'm getting goosebumps right now, uh, because he called me the day of uh, the, the day he received the diagnosis for his son. Um, and he said his voice was shaking on the phone and he just said, uh, this is happening. My son has just been um, diagnosed with the glioblastoma. And uh, uh, I just had to sit down and I, uh, you know, uh, it was interesting because the lab, we had been focusing on cancer, but we had never studied glioblastoma. We'd never studied brain cancers because uh, brain cancers are a beast. <laughs> uh, and glioblastoma is one of the worst types of brain cancers. Um, and I didn't know anything about brain cancers. I was working on breast cancer and prostate cancer, ovarian cancer. And so um, he just said, I need you to, um, Hold the lab together and uh, um, and just uh, be by my side and help me out here. And so um, and the reason I'm saying this is it basically um, uh, it did affect the whole lab and everybody. Um, the way they approached their research afterwards was it was very different, right? So that is a personal impact uh, of this diagnosis on the whole. Um, our whole lab and on me, uh, and uh, you know the I afterwards I was helping him um, through that journey along with a bunch of people um, figure out what are the options, you know, what are the clinical trials, what are the new uh, up and coming um, treatments that are up uh, um, available. Um, and, uh, I still remember sitting in this room. So he had assembled this, he, he was the head of a department at Stanford. So he had assembled this huge team of, you know, we were, they were the best of the best scientists at Stanford and, um, we are all in this room together. And, um, one of the scientists who was his, um, prodigy, so to speak said, so what can we do? What are our, what are our options? You know, um, and uh, uh, one of the neuro oncologists that was there basically said, "Well, this is glioblastoma. You know, um, it's fifteen months. Um, that's really the bottom line. There's nothing much you can do about it." And uh, I just remembered, you know, I still remember that because I. It was, I couldn't believe it, you know, um, here we are sitting in, um, 2015 it was, and, and someone's telling me that, uh, there's nothing you can do for a 15 year old that's just been diagnosed with glioblastoma. Um, so, but I have to say that, um, what I took away was, so my boss and my mentor, um, he never gave up. He never gave up. And he made sure that all of us who wanted to help him also didn't give up. And we continued looking for different ways that we could help and, you know, tried everything we could, threw everything at it. And so that's something I'll always take away that, um, 
no matter the odds, right? Like um, it's um, something that I've taken away from him that you shouldn't give up. Um, so, um, so that was a really um, my first exposure to cancer. So there's never been cancer in my family uh, or extended family. And that was really my first exposure to someone I knew um, being affected by it. And uh, yeah, uh, sadly, my professor lost his son two years uh, after that. Um, and, um, you know, we were all uh, uh, thinking that uh, would he come back from it? Or would he not? But he came back um, after taking a little break. He came back to the lab um, determined to, um, to throw everything at cancer again. Uh, and, and, you know, just immersed himself in the research of uh, early detection again. And, um, yeah, and that's um, how we were all, again, in the lab, motivated to do better. Um, and we started doing some work on actually brain uh, tumor imaging. And uh, um, we, we made some progress with, we have some, very nice imaging agents that were developed as a result of that personal tragedy. Um, so that's sort of my first exposure uh, to cancer. And, um, and, and then a couple of years after that, uh, you know, when uh, I guess we were all thinking that, okay, we're slowly getting back to normal, the lab's getting back to normal, is when, um, it happened to my family, and uh, uh, and it it's uh, funny because um, uh, I I guess I sort of knew before my daughter's MRI, <laughs> uh, so she had been um, uh, you know um, what we you know people had been commenting that she was very skinny, not gaining weight, and and I remember telling pediatrician that um and the pediatrician was like well she's just you just have to feed her better and um and then um there was a, a another interesting observation actually from my mother who had spent a summer with us that uh, uh, my daughter was actually uh, uh she, she my mother was saying you know I, I was sleeping with her in her room and she gets up in the middle of the night a couple of times to go to the bathroom. And she also drinks water at night. Like she keeps a big bottle of water next to her and she drinks the whole bottle through the course of the night. And, you know, because my mother is a pediatrician, um, so she, she sort of said, well, this is not normal. Um, normally kids don't wake up and drink in the night, um, you know, going to the bathroom is different, but they don't never drink water. So she was worried that it could be some form of diabetes. Mm -hmm. So we went in and, you know, I told the pediatrician and she ran a bunch of tests and it was not diabetes. Um, but, uh, and we ran a whole panel of blood tests and nothing. So she said, you know, we'll just We'll just wait and see and watch. Uh, I don't think it's anything. Maybe it's just a habit that she's developed. Um, and then uh, a, a few months after that, uh, um, we uh, I noticed that my daughter was, you know, she has a tendency for having motion sickness and she would throw up during car rides. And um, I just noticed that the frequency was increasing. And so I went to the pediatrician to say, um, uh, you know, is there something for motion sickness? Can we get her some medicine or uh, something like that? And, and she, the pediatrician gave us some suggestions. And then we both noticed that Anika had lost uh, even more weight. So uh, she had, her weight had dropped by three, four pounds within the span of the two months that we had met early before. And, and so the pediatrician at this point was also a little bit concerned. She was not sure why she was, this is a growing child. Uh, was, you know, she was nine at the time, my daughter. 
So, uh, so she said, I'll recommend you to a endocrinologist. Uh, so it, maybe there's a, a some um, 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 I- impact of the growth hormone. Uh, and so there's a great endocrinologist here and I'll recommend you to her. And I said, sure, why not? Um, and, um, and so, uh, I remember meeting this endocrinologist and she was this fantastic doctor. Um, you know, I, I have a great respect for both our pediatrician and this doctor in particular. Um, I remember we met, it was late at night, eight 30 was, we were our last appointment and, um, but she was not in a hurry. She took almost 45 minutes. Um, just understanding um, all the background and the history, asking a bunch of questions and um, doing all these measurements about growth. Uh, and then at the end of it, uh, I happened to mention my mother's observation that, you know, Anika is drinking a lot of water and at night she has to wake up. And that was it for the for that endocrinologist, that was a classic sign of um, what she called uh, diabetes, but diabetes insipidus, it's called. And that's something that happens when your pituitary glands are affected and pituitary glands are in, in, the, in the head. And it's called the master gland, the pituitary gland, and it controls all of your hormones uh, in, in the body. So she said, it could, it could be a sign of something wrong with that pituitary gland. So let's do a bunch of these tests and uh, we'll find out if that's something that is, is a problem there. And so I was like, sure, yeah. Um, and <laughs> I still remember going back to the car and my husband was waiting uh, with my other kid. And he's like, you know, she's just not eating. There's nothing wrong with her. Um, you know, we sh- yeah. But at this point, I think, um, you know, the mother's instinct uh, sort of kicked in. And I think all the mothers listening in would would identify because, you know, when there's something really wrong, like, you know, when it's a simple thing, like, I don't know, something that's just a, um, a scrape that you need to bandaid or something. But, you know, when something's not right with your child. And so I was sort of obsessed with that. And um, the next few days, uh, I was watching her carefully. And um, then uh, one day, uh, she um, uh, she was sent back from school because she threw up in school. Um, and um, and and then I was a little bit concerned because it was not normal. And by this time, actually her appetite had um, dropped. So she was really not eating. I was trying everything to give her all the foods that she liked, but she would literally pick at her food and, you know. um, And so now my researcher brain um, kicked in because I've established models in mice. And um, one of the first things that happen when you make or introduce cancer to a mice, a mouse, is um, weight loss. Weight loss is the, really the first sign that you see in the mouse that something's wrong. Um, and of course, loss of appetite, right? They don't eat. So uh, I was really worried by this time. And, um, um, and then I, um, Actually, one day she came back, the day she threw up, she came back and she said, you know, sort of my head is hurting, like the back of my head. And so that's when I actually called my mentor and I, you know, I, I just, uh, 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 I sent him an email and a message and then I left a message on his phone saying, I don't know, maybe I'm overreacting, but um, if possible, can we just do a scan? Uh, um and I called the endocrinologist at, as well and told her. And the endocrinologist at this point said, let's do an MRI. Um, let's do an MRI and see what's happening. And um, and I think before the MRI was done, even I knew, right? Uh, I knew that 
this is this is something you know there is something in the she has a tumor in her brain um and sure enough uh, it was a tumor that they found in this um just around the pituitary gland and so that was what was causing all of the symptoms with growth and um you know the throwing up and the headaches um all of that was because of this tumor in her and so uh but at that from that point on like um my mentor was uh, uh there by my side uh so she was transferred to the Stanford Children's Hospital and all of her subsequent care was with Stanford Children's Hospital. And um, so, um, yeah, I was, you know, I think the rest of it, uh, like, you know, for all of you who've gone through cancer, is like a blur, right? Uh, you remember certain moments, but everything else is like, it goes in fast forward. <laughs> After that first diagnosis, everything is fast. Uh, everything has to happen fast. And um, yeah, so um, step by step, I think uh, we, what they told us was um, uh, that uh, this kind of tumor, so the pituitary gland apparently is right behind the nose. Uh, so what they typically do is they, the surgery to remove those kind of tumors, they have to go through the nose. Um, and uh, so they involve the ENT uh, team, surgery team. Uh, and actually Stanford Children's apparently pioneered this uh, technique. Uh, so they, they had a really good team there. And so they went, so the surgery was done almost within two days of the diagnosis. Um, and they didn't, before they did the surgery, uh, again, this is something that cancer patients will be familiar with. In many cases, they can't tell what type of uh, brain tumor it was, right? They have to know whether it's a glioblastoma or something else. So you have to find out through a biopsy. And biopsy is when they take a sample of the tissue and, uh, and then they analyze it in the lab. So um, the only way to do that um, in, in brain tumors uh, and in many other cancers as well is you surgically, right? So in her case, what they did was they went through the nose uh, and then the neurosurgeons try and remove as much of the tumor as they can at the same time doing the biopsy to find out what it is. Um, so um, that's, you know, waiting for the, that diagnosis is all, you know, really nerve wracking. Um, and then the surgery itself, uh, I think, I still, I think those, my husband, and he says that's the worst day. <laughs> and I have to sort of agree uh, for multiple reasons, but, um, but that surgery itself was eight hours. So it was eight hours. Uh, it's a long, long surgery. And, uh, and then um, they warned us that, you know, uh, when she comes out of anesthesia, she's going to be in a lot of pain. And, um, you know, it, she, they'll be scary to look, the children, because they have all these tubes everywhere. Um, and so, um, yeah. It, at, at this point, I think for children like uh, my daughter, who was about nine years old or even younger who go through cancer, I cannot understand because they don't understand who are all these people poking at me and, you know, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? And so she was so angry, like, she was so pissed at all these people coming and taking blood from her. And uh, we didn't know how to talk to her or explain what was happening, right? We were in shock. We don't even know what's happening. So it's really traumatic. And I can only imagine that for parents with kids younger, toddlers, babies, you know, the cancer wing was full of them. Uh, 
it's really, really tough. And yeah, very sobering and very humbling to be in that past center, uh, as they call it, the pediatric oncology center. Um, and so I just remember that that first night as she recovered, um, it was so horrible because she was in so much pain and, um, you know, just crying and, you know, your parents, we, as parents, we're helpless. We cannot do anything. Um, um, yeah, that's the most helpless that you actually, like, you feel like, yeah, it's, I could say, it's very hard to explain, but um, you wish you could do something. You wish you could take away the pain, but, uh, you know, it's, um, yeah, that was a horrible night. Um, and then after that, it was a slow recovery, but she recovered, uh, in a, a two weeks, she was at the hospital and, um, by then they knew what type of cancer it was. So it was, uh, uh, they found out it's a type called germinoma, uh, and germinomas apparently, as I learned later, what is sort of more common among Asians, South Asians. Uh, um, and it, it can happen in other tissues as well, but the brain is the most common one. Um, and so, um, the other thing that was good was out of all the brain tumors, germinoma is the one that's treatable. So, um, it is responsive to chemotherapy and responsive to radiation therapy, uh, and so, um, I remember my mentor, uh, you know, he was calling me every day, um, and he would come and see, see us in the hospital every day. Uh, and I remember him calling me to tell this and saying, guy three, it's not glioblastoma, it's germinoma. You'll be okay. You know, we can, we can, uh, beat this together. Uh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. But, uh, you know, she'll get through it. Um, so, yes, so after the surgery, we went, she went through chemotherapy, uh, four rounds of chemotherapy and then radiation. Uh, and then the whole thing was about, I would say about eight, nine months of treatment in and out of the hospital. Um, but, you know, she made it. Um, and we sort of knew after the first two cycles of chemotherapy, when they did an MRI, uh, the, the tumor that was left behind from the surgery, we saw that it was completely gone. There was no tumor left. Um, and uh, um, so that, yeah, you know, after that, I think for cancer patients, you only worry about recurrence and, you know, is something going to show up one year from now, two years from now? Um, so she gets monitored every year, um, but she's um, she's a survivor today. <laughs> and I feel so blessed and lucky because um, I have been through the other side. I have seen glioblastoma and seen what a devastating disease that is. So... Um, yeah, that's sort of my story um, of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I think I've spoken a lot, so I'll stop there. And uh, <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate that. I didn't want to interrupt you because I think you were, I think there was so much power in what you were saying and the spe specificity yeah. of the story, I think means a lot. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Because I, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we've spoken before, and I, I I didn't realize kind of the nuances, the fact that the biopsy and the surgery are essentially the same thing, and it's only after the surgery, so it's almost like you've endured without even knowing what what it is. Like you you know there's something there, but you don't know exactly what it is, and yet there's a treatment modality that's happened, and here you are navigating as a mother mm -hmm. as searcher your mother instincts it's almost like the 
the impetus to get diagnosed was your motherly instincts and you pushing because you were a reason. So there was so much nuance in that story, guys, that I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'd love to hear how old Anika is today. Yeah. And does she remember anything? Is it yeah. true? Yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit about how she's doing, how she is. Is it still anger? If it is anger, I told you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she's, she's 13 today. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, she, you know, she's doing really well. Um, and in terms of memories, she doesn't, she tells me that she doesn't remember too much. Like she doesn't remember all the surgery, surgery and post-surgery and all of that. Um, I think she, and it's something maybe that children do automatically, but she remembers all the nurses who were the kindest to her. So she loved this one nurse practitioner. So uh, nurse practitioners are sort of almost like physicians. They are the ones who are running all the protocols um, and they're more accessible than the physicians uh, in, in the US medical system. And so I would be messaging this nurse practitioner all the time, you know, with concerns, questions and but she was this really bubbly uh, person, uh, always cheerful. And she brought so much energy with her into the room. And Anika loved her. And, um, and uh, I think that's sort of the power in pediatric oncology. Like I felt that all the people around us, uh, the nurses and the physicians, um, they they tried to be um, um, cheerful and um, try to make the kids laugh. Um, and uh, that's something my mentor also always said. He said, no matter what, you should not break down in front of her and should be scared or show that you're worried. You have to always make sure she's surrounded by laughter and positive thoughts. Um, positive energy. Um, and so that's what that pediatric oncology wing is at uh, in um, uh, Packard, in the Stanford Children's. And I'm sure it's in all pediatric oncology practices. They have to be extra cheerful and extra um, happy for the sake of the kids. So yeah, she remembers all the good things. She remembers the nurse or this nurse practitioner and um, things like that. Uh, uh, I think she still has a little bit of anger. So in her case, um, the tumor um, destroyed her pituitary gland. So she has to take uh, hormones uh, replacement for life. So every day she takes about five or six tablets. Um, and so she's not allowed to forget that she's been through this. And um, and um, so uh, it's a really interesting in her case, everything has to be replaced. So her, she had to take growth hormone to grow. Um, and so she's, she, she knows she's at a, like a, a different from the other kids. She has to take these uh, meds. Um, and uh, so I think there is a little bit of anger there um, in, um, yeah, but with time, I'm guessing there'll be acceptance and she'll realize she was one of the lucky ones. Um, there's something you said that I really want to underscore. It's, um, it's the fact that you as a mother couldn't break down in front of your child. And in your case, your child's really young. Yeah. And guys, I know that my mom didn't do the same thing with me. So my mom came to the U.S. to stay with me when I was going through treatment. And I, I didn't know this until fairly recently, actually, so far, far out from end of treatment. But she would go on walks and break down on her walks because she didn't allow herself to break down in front of me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know yeah. if Nika knows this yet because maybe she was too young. But when I got to know that, 
I, I can't tell you how much I appreciated it. Actually, there's a lot yeah. of love that comes from just that moment of putting aside your needs and putting your child yeah. in front of it, and it shows up across the board. But there is something so poignant about that moment of you not being able to show your true emotions in service of the person you're caring mm-hmm. for, and especially your child. Yeah. So, yeah. Very much, uh, even though yeah. we're talking like a young child, and in my case, adult child, it was still a similar kind of monthly moment. And I hate yeah. It, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, um, but I do, you know, think about um, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, and that goes back to our conversations about caregivers, right? Uh, in my case, I have to say that I was at Stanford uh, and Stanford, and I was a staff scientist at Stanford. So Stanford has this faculty staff help center. Mm. So you can book appointments with uh, counselors and um, you can talk about anything. You can talk about work, you can talk about grief. Um, and so I actually made use of that uh, because I felt like I needed uh, to talk to someone and um, it was hard to talk to my husband because we were both so emotional and uh, we were just you know it was just breaking down with talking with him and so I had to reach out for help and uh, and you know I was lucky that I was at Stanford where I could access this service uh, that was available um, but I feel that's really important that caregivers have that outlet to be able to um, break down <laughs> if needed. So, no, I, I appreciate yeah. you sharing that. It's quite temporal. So, by the time this podcast comes out, it will been many months. But we we just launched um, we just launched mental health support on our platform for caregivers. Actually, uh, precisely to the point you just made. Um, in our case, we have yeah. an. MD survivor who um, went, got diagnosed with a rare cancer and is on the other side of it. And she chose to sort of pivot her career and get trained as a coach and offers uh, coaching mm-hmm. for cancer caregivers and survivors. And she's been phenomenal. And I, I think there's something yeah. about meaning support that is so private and personal and contextual to what you individually are going through, but having someone who maybe has a somewhat, like at least understands kind of the lived experience of it um, is partly why we have her who joined our platform. So mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm so glad. Kaitri, your story is so powerful. So usually I do like a three sentence, three bullet wrap up. And I actually don't know how to do that in this case, because I think the story you've shared is so... <laughs> Sorry, I took up too much time, I think, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, we usually post edit our podcast, but this one, I really don't want to actually, because I think there was such beauty and such impact in what you shared that I actually, I, I am struggling to summarize it. Um, but I will make an attempt, but instead of me summarizing it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a final question. Um, and close our podcast. Okay. So my question is, uh, I'm cheating. Mm-hmm. I'm collapsing two questions of mine into one, one question. Um, so you come from India, as do I. Uh, a lot of our listeners are sitting in India. Yeah. And in India, if I look at the cancer statistics, it's pretty, in comparison to the US, mm-hmm. um, that's good. Not, not yet. Uh, and we can, we can have an entire podcast as to why. But given kind of where we're sitting, both both in the Stanford ecosystem in California, have access to cutting edge treatment and diagnostics, and relatively lo- mm-hmm. com- comparatively a lot more privilege. If you could leave our listeners globally with a thought, what would that be? Yeah. So, I think. In particular with India, I think I have some thoughts. And the reason is really because my mother um, 
also was you know she came when my daughter was going through her illness and she was she stayed with us for a while and um and she has worked in hospitals in india in chennai and um she's worked with children who are going through cancer right and um and what she told me which i think i'm still i still take carry with me because i want to do something about it at some point is she said you know at stanford and at this children's hospital it it was a one it, it was beyond just the doctors and the nurses um uh, as i said everyone in that pediatric oncology division is um doing going out of their way to make sure the children are happy and um uh, not sad because of all the treatment that they're going through and the things that they do for example there's a lot of like support for these kids so there's a lot of material support so these kids get a lot of you know stuffed toys and games and color book coloring books and um yeah things that we cannot even imagine in india you know uh it's but it it uh, it helps these kids especially the little kids right um because as i said today my daughter just remembers all these nice things about her journey and and then the that was one aspect of it and then the other aspect was also there were these they call them child life specialists and these were just social workers um and uh, uh, any time the child was going through a treatment in the pediatric oncology whether it's a chemotherapy infusion or something else this specialist would be there to explain the procedure to the child um and also sometimes just to hold their hand uh, and maybe uh, tell them distract them with stories with something else and um so there was a lot of support like that and, and if, for example the other thing that i still remember is this children's hospital at stanford they had a school it, there's a hospital school so for kids who are in the hospital for weeks uh with whatever treatments they need to go through there's a hospital school that they can go to and actually anika and me went to the school um and um and you're just very moved by all the generosity and the kindness of all these people and so both me and my mother just felt that uh this was just missing in india you know we have the best healthcare uh i mean we have really good doctors uh, well trained doctors but it would be very nice to have some of this kind of support in um our hospitals in india because it makes a big difference in how the children um go through their cancer journey uh here's what i love about your answer because i feel as mm-hmm. like- you did two things you painted a vision for what it is that we as a community of indians who have the ability to make an impact can help create this better future yeah of cancer in india and the second thing that i love that you did is i don't know if you realize this but i think you gave a really practical tip to everyone which yeah. is if you know someone especially a child going through cancer yeah small things matter a lot mm-hmm. yeah the small gestures it's the positivity it's the keep a smile on your face it's the uh, books and toys and kindness and generosity that goes a long way mm-hmm. and those are all things that the community can support yeah and those going through cancer with so i i appreciate you sharing that because i think a lot of our listeners sometimes struggle with how do i help mhm maybe that's maybe that's one way they can so yeah yeah definitely just even visiting the kids in the cancer wings and hospitals in india right and uh, spending time with them that's at least a small gesture but that it makes a big difference for them yeah guys we thank you so much for coming on our podcast and sharing your story yeah um, mm-hmm. i can't tell you how much uh, it means to me that you were willing to share the story because i have a feeling it's going to 
really help other people navigating similar situations, navigate it better. So yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Samira. I, I think you're doing a wonderful job uh, with Manta Cares, and I, yeah, I'm, I wish and I'm, uh, I'm here to support you in any way I can. <laughs> Thank you. We will, we will make change together. So yes, we will. This podcast show notes and newsletter is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice and no doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of information on this podcast or any materials linked from this blog is at the user's own risk. The content here is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.